Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we conclude our study of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 20 titled, Ye Have Not So Learned Christ. This is part two of two. Sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture and then they just say, well, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've, I just have felt God in my life my whole life. I just have always felt, I pray, I pray all the time. They'll just start talking about, you know, God this and God that and pray this. And... They don't even understand they're alienated from God by their sins. Not just their unbelief, by the way. The false teaching today is the only thing that separates you from God is your unbelief. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Your unbelief is part of your sin. It's a sin to not believe God. That's just one of your sins. Yeah. But you're separated from God by those sins that Christ died for. Their understanding is darkened, therefore they don't understand they're even alienated from it. And it's through the ignorance that is in them. And that's when you try to open the Bible and say, look, the Bible says, well... You know, you can interpret that Bible to say anything. You know, you can make that Bible. And that thing's been translated so many times and so many people have changed it and all that. That's what you hear? They just refuse to come out of their ignorance because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if they won't hear the Word of God, and uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says you must believe that it is the Word of God, otherwise it doesn't work. And that's why they remain ignorant because of the blindness of their heart and that's what it ends up with that's where you end when you start with rejecting the light given to you your understanding is darkened you don't even understand that you're alienated from God and you continue on in ignorance and then you turn into a spiritually blinded person Gentile and this lack of purpose and godless existence is what leads to the overall immorality and wickedness in the Gentile world. In other words, what you see in what's called social liberalism, where it's all about Sodom, and it's all about abortion, and it's all about feminism, and it's all about LGBTQ, XYZ, or whatever. That's all the end we've been talking about. The lack of purpose and this godless existence results in our culture that we have today, basically, is what it's saying. Who, being past feeling, notice that, there was a time God was talking to them, they were under conviction, and they're going to admit it on Judgment Day, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, yeah. and that basically means they'll do whatever they want, with whoever they want, sexually and in other perverted acts, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Me, me, me. Me generation, all about me. Yeah. And that's all that matters. To this Gentile world that we see today, there's not, it, it's not that uh, really things have changed as far as the Gentile mind. It's that their numbers have increased. The millennials, yes. This millennial generation. And the difference is that the numbers have increased. And so where you used to see it among, you know, a few million people uh, in the United States of America, now it's a couple of hundred million. And so it's increasing with the increased population. It's increasing everywhere. And it says, and being given over to sin, that's what causes them to reject Christ. And you need to understand that. When you're trying to debate somebody into believing the gospel uh, based on the historical evidence for the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the manuscript evidence that tells us that the scripture is to be trusted and all that, that's great. You need to know that stuff, but you need to understand that until they will repent of their sins, you're not going to get them to believe the gospel. And what you have a lot of people doing today is deciding I don't need to repent of my sins because see, everybody knows that it's true that Jesus died and that Jesus rose again. They're going to admit it on Judgment Day. You just write that down. When someone says, well, I don't really believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. You're a liar. Amen. 
You're going to admit it when you stand before Him. But the reason they lie is because they love their sin. But what we've got today, and this is a picture of Laodicea, is where they'll say, well, I'm not going to repent of my sin. God loves me the way I am. I'm going to be a gay Christian. And now because the gays are bold in their sin, that's emboldening other people. And so there's people just fornicating but calling themselves Christians and dopeheads who, I'm a dopehead for Jesus now. And you got porn for Jesus and strippers for Jesus and everything. It's all going on. I'm not making it up. This is the real world you're living in. Well, just a second. Now, you take the biblical gospel which says... You need to understand what separates you from God and it's your sins that Jesus died for. And your unbelief is really a lie to begin with and it's because you love your sin. And that's why Paul preached. All these guys claim they're Pauline preachers who deny that. Paul preached repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And he never once, never once did Paul say, I'm just talking about your mind. Never once did he say, well, I mean just repent about what you believe. Paul preached repent with no disclaimers. Everything you are, everything you believe, everything you do, repent toward God. With faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not being preached today, so it's producing a false church. You can have clown shows at your church. You can have people dropping out in parachutes and dropping in the front yard. You can give away gift cards. You can, you can have a raffle to give away a car automobile. They're all doing it to reach people. You ain't reaching anybody but somebody who's greedy and just wants something. The only way to reach people is to preach the gospel and you've reached them. Amen? Amen. I want you to understand that. I believe the reason so few people are preaching the gospel is because they define reach wrong. They define reach as someone dropping their knees and getting saved. No, you didn't have anything to do with that. That's the Holy Spirit. You reach somebody when you give them that chick track or that all ball track. You reach somebody when you just look at them. Like Charlie, we've talked about how you just look at somebody and say, Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again. You just preach the gospel. Amen. Now, what's, what's, what else is there to say? Repent and believe the gospel. That's it. Count those words up. I mean, who can't say that? I don't know, any of you can't get that out. And if you do that, then it's all the rest is up to God and that person. But, like Doug said, if they don't believe what you're preaching is the Word of God, you've reached them, but they're not going to repent. They're not going to believe, if they don't believe that message is from God, they're not going to believe the gospel. They're not going to be saved. But what's behind it? You, arguing with them and debating with them? I'm not saying not to do that because it's good to tear down whatever walls they've got built up. But the Bible says what's behind it is they reject Christ because of their sin. I'm not making it up. Jesus said it. Love sin, you reject Jesus. Unless someone comes to you with a false gospel that says you can continue to love your sin and still be saved, which is the false Laodicean gospel of today. John 3.19, Jesus said, And this is the condemnation, that they don't believe on Me. It's not what He says. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because what? Their deeds were evil. Their deeds were They loved their sin. Christ died for their sins and they don't want to repent of their sins. And so what do they do? They either don't repent and stay in their sin or they become Baptist preachers. Amen. Your Baptist churches and your, uh, a lot of the Grace Brethren churches and a lot of the... Uh, what we call fundamental churches. I mean, Satan got the liberals already. They have a false gospel of their own. But among fundamental churches, Satan has filled the pulpits with men who will give you a gospel where you can still love your evil. Still love those wicked deeds and be saved. 
No repentance. And I am an outcast among that group and I plan to be there right to the day God either calls me out or I die. I don't want nothing to do with that group. They can call themselves fundamental Baptists. They can call themselves anything. King James Bible believers even. If they preach that nonsense, that darkness, I don't want anything to do with them. We're going to con uh, confront men and women with the truth. Amen. And that includes the fact that they love their sin and need to repent. Amen. Amen. By definition and by contrast, a Christian has repented. Amen. By definition, a Christian is no longer following himself and his own beliefs, his own nature, his own deeds, but he has repented and he is now following Jesus. That's by definition and by contrast. The difference between the Christian and the world is supposed to be that you have left behind all your false ideas, all your false beliefs, all your love for yourself and all your love for your wicked sin, your deeds. That's by contrast and by definition. A Christian has repented. And by the way, it just begins with being... When you're saved, that's when you begin repenting. What's wrong with a lot of people today is they stopped repenting even though they repented and were saved. They refused to repent any longer. God will show them something they need to, uh, uh, to recognize is wrong in their life and they just think, oh, I'm, not, I'm fine with it. I'm good. No, we're, it's a life of repentance. God's showing you the, this is something you need to do. This is something you need to change. This is something you need to turn from. One of the most satanic doctrines in the Laodicean church today is the denial of repentance. It's a satanic doctrine. It's not just a difference in opinion. It's satanic. Biblical Christianity calls on Gentiles to what? Repent. Repent. The Pauline ministry is described in Acts 26.20. Read that with me. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. If you hear any preacher present a gospel where... Now, I always say this. The word repent doesn't always have to be used, but it should be inferred. Uh, when someone calls on you to turn from what you believe and turn from your sins to Jesus, that's the call you to repent. It's the same thing. But these days, I think we need to double up on the word repent. That's just my opinion. But I think we need to double up on it. But if they preach a gospel where they're not calling on you to turn from, but to simply receive the facts that are presented in the gospel and don't confront you with your sin and, you, and the fact that that's why Jesus died on the cross, then you need to turn them off. And that's not a Pauline preacher. And folks, during this age, all true preachers are Pauline preachers. <laughs> so Gentiles, unsaved non-Jews, are those who will not repent, who are non-Jews and unrepentant. Gentiles do not repent. That's what marks the difference between Christians and Gentiles. But look what he ends in verse 20. Read that. But ye have not so learned Christ. If you're reading the right book and sitting under sound doctrine, you have not learned. What he means is ye have not so learned Christ. You have not learned it that way. Paul didn't preach it the way they're preaching it today. He preached it the way you just heard it. And if you see it preached, and it looks, it's tantalizing. It's tempting to be a part of this church. This And folks, I've been tempted by it myself in my earlier years to be a part of that because let's just face it, it makes things a whole lot easier if I can go preach the gospel and not mention sin and just say all you have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again. Well, I believe that. <gasps> You're saved. Oh, wait a minute. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. Do you believe the Bible? Those very same people that are in these churches will tell you they don't even believe the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah. And when you define sin, ask them what they mean by sin, they won't define it biblically. To them, sin is, you know, hating people. You shouldn't hate people. What, what, what do you mean by hate people? Telling them they're sinners. They always define sin as what other people do. That's true too. 
But those are both. Uh, listen to what I just said. He said, you shouldn't hate people. How you define hate? By telling them they're sinners. You get that? That's the modern church. You obey God and preach to the lost and confront them with their sin, the false church will call you a hater. Let God be true and every man a liar. But, like Jenny said also, then there's those who just think sin is what other people do. <laughs> not what I do. <laughs> what I'm doing is not really a sin, but you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. They call it the big I and the little you. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're to be a contrast to what we just studied about the Gentiles. Many professing Christians are actually Gentiles. You need to recognize that. And I hope none of you here today feel under conviction that you are a Gentile who is, is living in vanity. But too many are. Hey, listen, you can call yourself a Christian all you want. Uh, you can call yourself a bumblebee. I don't care. But that doesn't make you one. Reality check. Some of you heard this before. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Say that with me. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Here's an example. Somebody wake John up. I want him to see this. Bumping. There's our example, John. That's a saved man right there. Amen. That's a saved young woman right there. Amen. Amen. But look behind him. 100,000, 110,000. How many? 110,045. 110,045 people back there. You know the difference? These two are going to have this memory to share. And forever. Amen. Folks, if you think when you go to heaven you get amnesia, you're wrong. This is going to be a memory they're going to share forever. You say, oh, going to a football game. I don't care what it is. When a saved man is spending time with his daughter, that's Amen. godly. Amen. When a saved man is with his daughter and they're handing out gospel tracts. Uh, Amen. Amen. But you know the difference? There's people in the back. I think it's pretty safe to say most of them are saved. Yeah. Not because they're in blue, by the way, either. It's not the color that they're wearing. Red and blue and maize, no matter what color. By the way, it's beat that team up north because you don't say the M word. But all these people, they can be as happy as they want to be, but without Christ... An unsaved Gentile will come to the end of life and see that moments like this just don't matter. It ain't going to matter. Not to a hill of beans, as they say. It's not going to matter. But saved members of the church of God have a very different perspective on life. Amen. Everything matters. The only time I felt bad, for example, I, I took my daughters to a movie once in a while. Not very often. Because even the cartoons are garbage. Yeah. And the only time I ever regretted taking my girls out to a movie was when it was garbage. Yeah. And afterwards I'd give them, you know, a little daddy lecture on what, what was wrong with that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We've had those yes. <laughs> but any time you spend time with somebody with a Christian love, whether it's as a uh, you know, parent or a spouse or a friend or whatever, and you are conducting yourself in a way that pleases God. And then no matter where you are, you should be a witness. Amen. And so whether you go to see Grant's tomb to see who's buried there, or you go to a Buckeye game, and even if you have maize and blue on, you should be there. I mean, that's not gonna, that can't be pleasing God. But, 
But your conduct, your conduct, and handing out those gospel tracts, and you know what? We take this for granted, but there's going to be young women who may have seen this girl with that fellow there, and I guarantee you the first thing they thought is, is that her husband or her dad? Yeah. That's the first thing. Then at some point they realized, oh, that's her dad. And then they're going to think, wow, that's weird. You don't yeah. think so? Yeah, yeah. And then they're going to wonder, wonder why. What, what? And then they see him getting out of gospel track. And these girls who don't have a real dad, or don't have a dad who loves them, they're going to see, oh, I see what the connection there, why she's got a daddy I've never had. Yeah. You talk to my wife about it. She'll tell you. And it makes an impression. I mean, we could, I could, we could dissect all kinds of different situations where you even, and I even, may take for granted that what we're doing isn't really all that spiritual. That's not the case. You do all, well, let me get ahead of myself. Everything matters to the Christian. 1 Corinthians 10.31, read that. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now think about that. What is he, I mean, most Christians never thought about it. You're going to eat to the glory of God? How do you do that? Well, you start by praying over your meal. Amen. <laughs> Not just when you're home and no one's around. Some people say, well, I think that's like the Pharisees. No, I didn't say stand up and say, Dear Lord, we thank you for the abundance of this table and for me being so spiritual that I'm praying so loud everyone in the restaurant can hear me. <laughs> that's the Pharisees. What I'm saying is you quietly bow your head and no one even has to hear what you're saying. But they see you bowing your head over the food that you're about to eat thanking the Lord. That's going to glorify God. Amen. And then you're not there getting drunk and yelling and screaming at each other. You're having a nice little time together. Some Christians have a problem with this, but if they don't cook your steak right, you don't scream at them. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you tip. <laughs> Amen. If you don't tip, shame on you. Amen. And when you tip, what do you do? Leave a gospel track. Amen. And... There's other things we could add to that. You just gave glory to God doing what? Eating. Yeah. <laughs> Think of that. And it says drink, obviously. We just said, you know, not getting drunk. You're drinking things. You know, you're not doing things. But whatsoever you do, cutting the grass, well, yeah. They see you are taking care of your property compared to the guy down the street that doesn't because he's a pot smoker and won't get off the couch. Yeah. Amen doesn't matter what it is, you can do it in a way that brings glory to God. Here's the other side of that. There's a lot of Christians, they will only do things when someone will pat them on the back. Yeah. And they want you to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We're supposed to do everything knowing one of these days God's going to say that to us yeah. and not be doing it for our glory. I was often talk about, you know, you like go through West Virginia and just about every bridge and building in that state was named by Robert Byrd after himself yeah. using taxpayer money. Yeah. That, that man lived his life in vain. Yeah. We don't go around, well, I'm going to do something that God will be pleased with, and so we will now call this the Greg Miller Memorial Church. I'm not even dead yet, but we're going to call it that. <laughs> and then we're going to get a website, PastorGregMillerIsAwesome.com. <laughs> Amen. T-shirts with my face, just like those Shea T-shirts, you're going to have my mug on there. Just say, Greg. Okay, laugh all you want, but there's preachers who do that. That's their ministry. It's to glorify them. I don't want anything named after me. Amen. I don't want my face on anything. Amen. Have mercy on people. Amen. <laughs> what do we want? We want God to be glorified. Amen. It's all about Jesus. I want to close with that poem. I just read the bottom two lines. That was a poem called Only One Life by C.T. Studd. And this is just two verses. There's, I don't know how they 
14, 15 verses, something like that. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. Amen. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let that get stuck in your head. Amen. Amen. And let's turn to page 51 and sing, Little is much when God is in it. <laughs> 